Today's program is being recorded. Any views expressed in this webinar are for general educational purposes only and do not represent any official views or positions of the sponsoring or presenter's organizations. Greetings and welcome to today's education program, Building Trust, Communication and Respect at Work, How to Thrive in a Multi-Generational Team Environment by Zach Girard and Doug Wood. This is your moderator, Shobha Mittal with ASQ's Quality Management Division. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of hearing from Zach Girard and Doug Wood. Please join me in welcoming them. Mr. Girard has worked over 20 years in gaming, leading teams and managing projects. He has helped others with gamification and project management. He has also presented at several local, regional and national conferences. He has seven ASQ and PMI certifications. These are CQIA, CQPA, SSGB, CMQOE, PMP, PMI ACP, and PMI PBA. Uh, Zach has published Board Games, Zombies, and Minecraft Gamification in Higher Education by IGI Global, Building Cities, Pirate Ships, and Fighting Zombies Using Minecraft to enhance online teaching by ASQ Education Division. Building Cities and Fighting Monsters, Park University's Minecraft Journey by Minecraft Education Edition. His firm, Gerard Consulting LLC, has worked with clients in education, nonprofits, and businesses. The company's website is https gerardconsulting.net. Moving on to Doug's introduction. Um, Mr. Wood has worked over 40 years in the areas of cost of quality, office waste, root cause analysis, performance measurement, etc. He has helped others with various ASQ certifications in quality auditing, management and engineering. He has also taught auditing, lean, Six Sigma, cost of quality, statistics and failure modes and effects analysis. He has four ASQ certifications and they are CQE, CQA, SSB, CMQOE. Doug has published the Certified Manager of Quality Organizational Excellence Handbook, fifth edition by the ASQ Quality Press, the Executive Guide to Understanding and Implementing Quality Cost Program, Reducing Operating Expenses and Increasing Revenue by ASQ Quality Press, Principles of Quality Cost, Financial Measures for Strategic Implementation of Quality Management, fourth edition by ASQ Quality Press. His firm, DC Wood Consulting LLC, has worked with clients in manufacturing, healthcare, and transactional businesses. The company's website is www.dcwoodsconsulting.com. And so, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Zach Gerard and Doug Wood. Zach and Doug, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Shoba. Uh, yeah, what a, what a long introduction, huh? Uh, so, well, I want to say, just basically greet everybody and thank them all for being here. I am the, uh, Doug Wood is the Vice Chair uh, for Education and Webinars for ASQ's Quality Management Division. Now, my co-presenter, Zach, and I would like to invite all of you to take part in a discussion about the impact of this talk, about, about the subject of this talk in my ASQ after this talk. You see, you're gonna see a link at the end of this talk to go there. And we'll also put the link to the discussion in the email that you will receive 48 hours after this talk. It'll have our contact information in there too. Uh, and if you're, if you're going to the World Conference on Quality Improvement in you know next month, Zach and I will be at the QMD booth in the exhibit hall. So if you're going, stop by and look us up. Okay, Zach. Awesome. Yeah, I, I just want to welcome everyone here too, and um, thank you, Doug and Shoba, and let's have some fun talking about generations at work. So just to give a brief overview of what we'll be covering today, uh, we'll just briefly define what a generation is. Look at all the generations that are currently living in the United States from the silent generation to generation alpha. Then we'll talk about managing and working with generations at work or in a volunteer environment. We'll share some lessons learned that Doug and I have learned along the way, uh, look at some future trends affecting 
uh, the workplace and then provide some additional resources if you're interested in this topic beyond the webinar. So to start off, um, you might wonder what is a generation? And you might have heard this or you might have uh, thought about it when you're looking at a family tree, but demographers define a generation as a group of people that are generally born around the same time. It's usually within about a 20 to 40 year time span. And this group of people, they have a list of shared events and then traits that have shaped them. So it could be economic events, political events, um, social events, and so on. And there are some limitations when you talk about generations that you won't be mindful of. The first one is that generations are millions of people. So the groups that Doug and I will talk about today um, are, are made up of tens of millions of people. And what you might find is that just because you were born within the time of that generation it does not mean that you relate to them. Um, and so there's cases where individuals relate to a different generation and that's okay. And then the other point to be mindful of is that as we talk about generations, it's not intended to be a stereotype. It's just the general traits of tens of millions of people born within a specific time period. Now I will pass this off to Doug to talk about the silent generation. Thank you, Zach. So the silent generation has affected the U.S. culture, upper management, board of directors, and they influence the directions of organizations, both large and small. This generation was born between 1927 to 1945. Their current age range is in their 70s to 90s. And there's approximately 21 million people in this group. There are several key events that they have lived through. You know, the Great Depression, for one thing. Uh, you know, there's a picture of the kid there, you know, please give my dad a job. That's an example of that. Uh, they've lived through World War II and the Korean War. Okay. The, the World War I, of course, was earlier than this. They've also lived through the civil rights movement. And, and for them, uh, this, this, these were the fairly key events, and in some cases, very traumatic events that affected them. So these key events then help build traits, uh, strengths and weaknesses and opportunities. Uh, some of the strengths. The silent generation was hardworking and very determined and very thrifty. Some of the weaknesses of this group. With every strength comes a weakness. Uh, they're very traditional minded. Uh, technology is a little tricky for them. Sometimes they're, they're sort of challenged by it. They also tend to be quieter, less outspoken, hence the term silent generation. Now, there are some opportunities that this generation brings to organizations. These people are generally stable. They're very loyal, and they're very resourceful. So the next generation are the baby boomers, okay, uh, born between 1946 to 1964. And, and, okay, this is my generation, all right? Uh, their current age range is from the 50s to the 70s. Now, there's approximately 73 million people in the boomer generation, in, in the U.S. anyway. So that makes it a relatively large, you know, chunk of people. The baby boomer generation is currently working as experts in management, and also they have specific expertise, either internal or external, to their organizations. Uh, some of the key events that have influenced them. The, the post-World War II economic boom uh, has definitely influenced them and made them look at the world that way. Uh, the Vietnam War and the Cold War, both are things that this generation grew up in and lived through. And yeah, the space race, which was really hot before and, and it, it cooled off, but it seems to be heating up again. Anyway, the space race is one of those key events that, that helped build the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities of these boomers. In terms of strengths, the baby boomers are, they, they show a great deal of commitment to a task. They are team players, 
and they often act as mentors, helping newer generations, you know, learn, learn what things are. But there are weaknesses. They value structure, okay? And sometimes structure can get in the way of change. They are quite competitive, okay? And competition is a good thing and a bad thing. And they are or can be technology challenged, okay? So not all of them are, are really as quick on technology as some of the younger generations. The opportunities the boomers bring are positive reinforcement. They're generally positive in their outlook, perhaps because of the economic boom. Uh, they are very hands-on oriented. Let's go and do it. And they are task oriented. They drive towards getting it done. Now, Generation X is the next one, born between 1965 and 1980. And uh, yeah, I'll, don't worry, Zach, Zach will get to talk. He does the younger generations. Um, the current age range of Gen, Gen X is 40s to 50s. And they're a little smaller, not by much though, but there's 65 million people in this generation. The Gen X today are in mid-career. And they might be working perhaps as up to a director level in an organization, or they might be working as an expert, an internal or external expert. Now, because the baby boomers lasted longer in, in the job force, Generation X was held back from being promoted at a younger age. So the Gen X are more recently become leaders. They've just recently come into positions of authority. Uh, the key events that Gen X has seen. Uh, economic instability, okay? So that's been a thing since in, as they grew up, and that does affect their outlook. The end of the Cold War and the Gulf War in its entirety also took place during their, their life. And, and they saw the widespread application of the personal computer. Uh, this, this generation uh, generally wouldn't work with that device on the screen, the typewriter, okay? Uh, personal computers have been a thing. Some of the traits in Gen X, uh, they possess a strong work ethic. They're, they're really big on prioritizing, first things first. And they also show a lot of respect for others. Some of the weaknesses, they do tend to be a little bit more passive. They, they value efficiency, uh, in some cases, extremely so. And money has been a challenge for them. Again, back to that late promotion kind of thing, later in career promotions. The opportunities, though, the Gen X brings to the workplace, they are reliable, they are consistent, and they do value feedback when, when, when it's given to them in a positive sense. Okay, well, thank you, Doug, for looking at some of the older generations we have today. Um, now I will talk about some of the, the younger ones or up and coming, uh, one of them being millennials, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. They have several nicknames, Generation Y. So after Generation X, demographers decided to just call the next generation Generation Y. Um, you might have heard the term the trophy generation. So when a lot of these kids grew up in the 80s and 90s, there was a change in parenting philosophy where uh, parents wanted to make sure all their all the kids felt included if they were on a soccer team or a sports team. And so they started this practice of giving everyone a trophy, whether they won or not, um, but just for participating. And they're also called the echo boomers. And so the time frame for this generation is, is roughly between the 80s to the early 90s. And the current age range is in uh, about their mid-20s to early 40s on the older end. And it's approximately 72 million people. And some of the key events that have influenced them, so thinking of growing up in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, this generation got to live through a lot of economic prosperity um, basically up until the 2008 recession. And then what we're seeing today with the economic fallout from the COVID pandemic. Um, <clears throat> but then on the flip side, they saw a lot of layoffs. So um, looking at some of the, the, 
prior generations, it would have been their parents or grandparents. Um, they had grown up with this mentality that uh, you work somewhere for most of your career um, and then eventually retire. And what millennials saw is they saw their parents get penalized for uh, being loyal to employers. Um, and in 2008, they saw a fair amount of their parents were laid off, sadly, from their jobs or lost their houses. Um, they also grew up with um, a lot of concerns about security, not only at home, but internationally. Um, so a lot of this generation, they would have been kids when 9-11 happened, um, so watching terrorism, um, living most of their lives when the U.S. is at a time of war, be it in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, and then this is the first generation to, to grow up with the Internet. Uh, they would have been kids when the, the Internet was first emerging. And then they had mobile devices. So, so on the right, you see pictures of Game Boys. Um, the picture on the top right shows uh, millennials on their phone. Uh, it's a relatively common uh, sight to see if they're in a group. And so we want to dive a little bit deeper into this generation because Doug and I recognize that uh, there is a lot of talk about how employers can engage, recruit, and retain millennials. And so looking at some of the strengths they have, uh, areas that they, they excel in, they're very independent. Um, they're willing to take tasks on. They're willing to be assertive. Um, some of the people in this generation, they come to workplaces, and at, at day one, they want to start uh, telling people what to do or act like they own um, the business or the store, and, and that could be good and bad. Um, another strength they have is social responsibility. So a lot of the parents that raised millennials told them that they can make a difference in the world, and this generation believes that. And uh, you've probably seen the term corporate social responsibility get thrown around a lot. Um, it's a great way to give back to the community, but also for companies to advertise to millennials and younger generations. Um, a lot of millennials, they'll volunteer at places, they'll get engaged in groups, um, and ASQ is a great group for them to get involved in. Um, and they're also very flexible. So um, for this generation, they don't really think of work in terms of time. They think of it in terms of getting a task done, be it it takes a little bit of time, or maybe they're up all night working on it. Uh, because with the internet, they have access to inter information and the technology they need to work pretty much 24-7. Now, with their strengths also come some weaknesses, and one of them being their work ethic. And, and part of this is because they grew up with this mentality that everyone gets a trophy for participating. But sometimes participation means that you have to put in the work to be able to achieve mastery. And then having the internet at their disposal made it so much easier to get information compared to past generations. So those are some reasons why work ethic is listed as a weakness. Um, another one is loyalty. So as I had mentioned earlier, they grew up, they saw their parents get penalized for staying loyal to organizations. But then they also grew up with these tools on the internet like LinkedIn, Monster, Indeed. And so they had all these tools to find uh, different jobs and they took advantage of it. And, and the third part, the third weakness is patience. Um, so with technology, we've seen shorter tension spans and staying focused could be a challenge. Now, there are also some opportunities for organizations. So millennials are very good with technology. Um, so their technical skills are a huge plus for organizations. They're very creative. Um, and then they enjoy learning. So they, they love professional development programs. Um, again, I think ASQ is a great organization, great opportunity to engage them and help them grow in their career. So following millennials, you have Generation Z. They're also known as the I generation. Um, so, this, so the reason why they're called I generation is because they're the first generation of Americans. They've grown up and for their entire life, they've had the internet. So they've never known a time uh, pre-internet. Um, also called post-millennials or centennials. And a lot of them were born um, closer to the year 2000 or a little bit afterward, uh, basically between the, the mid-90s to about 2009. And currently, they're still growing up. So on the younger end, um, they're still figuring out kind of what they want to do with their lives or their career. Um, on the older end, they're in their early to mid-20s. So they're in college. Maybe they just graduated. So they're starting out their careers. And this generation is about the same size as um, the millennial generation, so about 72 million people. 
and some of the key events that that impacted them um, from their point of view, they grew up, they were kids or in high school during the 2008 recession and now the economic fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. So they've seen a lot of economic instability, but then also a lot of e-commerce. So a lot of um, using websites and tools on the internet to engage in buying and selling items. Um, they've, they've seen a lot of exposure to social issues. So gun violence being one of them, uh, very prominent in their mind. And then also COVID-19, a lot of demographers and historians have argued that COVID-19 is this generation's crisis um, that they're currently living through. And then they've seen a lot of technological innovation. So a lot of them have had smartphones for most of their lives or mobile devices, uh, voice technology. So Amazon Alexa, Google Home, um, very common to be used by this generation. And so Doug and I have thought it'd be good to dive a little deeper into Gen Z because they're currently coming into the workforce and we thought it'd be valuable for all of you um, to think about as you're looking at hiring this generation or working with them. And so some of the strengths they have, so being that they've spent all this time immersed in different technology, they're very adaptable. Uh, they're, they're very willing to pick up skills, uh, jump into stuff, be very hands-on. They're also very diverse. So this is the most diverse generation of Americans that we've ever seen. And not only diverse in terms of how their generation is made up, but also diverse in terms of thought. And they're very good at multitasking. So they're really good at being on their phone, texting someone, and then jumping into an email, talking to someone. They can jump between tasks very quickly. But there are also some weaknesses that come with that. So one of them being social skills, being able to work with large groups of people, and then having all this screen time um, has just made it where they've interacted with people less in person compared to previous generations. Another one's receiving feedback. So sometimes they feel that feedback could be um, judging them personally instead of talking about their work performance. And so this generation has a hard time uh, receiving feedback compared to prior generations. And then with technology, being able to jump between devices or um, apps they're using, it's made it where it's very easy for this generation to get distracted. They tend to have a very hard time staying focused because their phone's going off, Amazon Alexa is sending them a reminder, they're getting pop-ups on their computer. And so that's a, a big weakness that they have. And there are some opportunities for employers to leverage Gen Z. So one of them being technical skills, which is similar to millennials. So being they've grown up with technology, they're very comfortable with it and very willing to help current and older generations navigate it. They're very realistic. So having grown up see, seeing 2008 and then the pandemic, they've had to take this very pragmatic view of the world um, which could be very helpful on project teams or uh, looking at innovation or improving operations, and then their work ethic. So they're willing to put in the work, and for this generation, they're very entrepreneurial, so a lot of them want to go on and create their own businesses, and they're willing to put in the work for it compared to millennials. And then there's Generation Alpha, which is the newest generation on the list. Um, they're nicknamed, so post-Generation C, so demographers not being creative, after Generation Z, they went back to A, and this generation is being born today. And this would actually be Doug's grandkids. Um, born, so the earliest time would be about 2010, um, up until about 2025 or into the 2030s. And currently they're in uh, pre-K or elementary school, and demographers estimate this will be about 35 million people. And so since they're still growing up, it's difficult to nail down their strengths and weaknesses. But what we can look at is the events that are influencing them. And one of them, similar to Generation Z, is economic instability. So they're currently growing up in the COVID-19 um, pandemic era. And then also the gig economy. So seeing um, uh, apps like Uber, um, so the sharing economy, sort of this reemergence of cottage industry with a lot of people creating their own businesses, going out on their own. Um, automation is another big factor that they'll, they'll grow up with related to the economy. 
uh, but then also social justice reform. So they've grown up seeing some of the uh, protests that happened during COVID-19 about um, making positive change in communities um, and civil rights. And then also the COVID-19 pandemic, so having lived through that. And then technological innovation. And, and for, for a lot of these kids, one of the first words they're saying is Alexa um, in reference to an Amazon Alexa device. And not only uh, voice technology, but also um, looking at self-driving cars, robotics, uh, cryptocurrency, so all, all this technological innovation that will shape this generation. And so talking about generations in the workplace, um, regardless of the generation, Doug and I found that there are shared goals across all generations, one of them being that everyone wants to be able to achieve professional success. They want to be excited about where they work at. They want to um, earn certifications, be it through ASQ or other organizations and then grow in their career, and then also make meaningful connections. So grow their network, develop new friendships, uh, make meaningful relationships that they'll carry on throughout their career and maybe afterward. And there's a lot of opportunities. And, and being that we're ASQ, talking about the quality field, um, it provides the opportunity to work in a challenging, complex environment. They can grow into leadership roles and they can add value to the bottom line and customers. And, it goes to say that quality is more than just statistics or just looking at numbers or manufacturing. If we think about it, regardless of industry, we all have to develop a working product that people could use and that could help them. And so um, looking at generations and working in a quality environment, it takes more than numbers. It takes leadership. It takes emotional intelligence. It takes being able to work with a diverse group of stakeholders and then working together to achieve shared goals. And I think that's where the quality field stands out uh, for all generations. And now I will pass it back to Doug to talk about motivation. Thank you, Zach. Um, so we're talking here about some universal universalities, okay? Uh, gaining motivation. Um, some of what we've talked about here is more US centric, okay? I mean that that's where Zach and I live, and that is what we can we can research most easily. What some of what we've said before may not apply in other cultures. Just keep that in mind. But motivation is is a issue. It's a big one. We need people need to be motivated, and there's plenty of uh, noise in the air over, you know, why aren't these new generations being motivated? Well. Uh, Motivation has been a challenge for every generation. Daniel Pink created a framework on motivation using these three words, purpose, mastery, and autonomy. Okay. Purpose is why are we doing it? What's the reason for this job? What's the reason? What are we trying to do? And as it says, this is more important to millennials and the Generation Z than some of the others. Autonomy. Daniel Pink means giving people the space and tools to do the work to grow and learn to create new ideas providing autonomy is a key piece of motivation and i'm sure that you have felt more motivated when you had you knew why you were doing it and you had the space to do it in now this tends to be a little bit more important for generation x and millennials and the third piece that pink says is mastery <clears throat> And this doesn't mean that you have it. This means you have the resources to master it. If, if someone is standing in the way and not allowing you to have the resources to learn what you need to learn, then that's going to affect your motivation. But if you have the resources to gain mastery and you have the autonomy to do the work and you know why you're doing it, okay, then you can be motivated too. This one tends to be a little bit more important to the silent generation and to the baby boomers. Uh, the, the, the thing is, those are drivers of motivation. Those three interconnect, okay, and they help build a better work group. Even though each generation has slightly different values, purpose, mastery, and autonomy work together to, to build 
to build uh, the motivation in the, in the group. Now, there are some tools that we can use to kind of build trust, improve communication, and encourage respect between generations in the workplace. The affinity diagram or affinity process is a tool that's not only useful in brainstorming ideas, but to organize them for use. You know, you have the ideas on post-it notes and you then arrange them. And the groupings of the ideas is based on the content of the ideas themselves, not according to some preconceived plan. That is a, it's a great tool to organize the thoughts coming out of brainstorming. A force field analysis is another tool that may be used to help with communication. Mainly, it's used to counter negative ideas and drive change. In the force field analysis, the negative ideas are written on one side of a vertical line, perhaps on, on a flip chart. And the positive phrases are listed on the other side of the line. So here's some examples, okay? Uh, a negative one, they never listen to us. What's a positive opposite to that? Okay, well, repetition is key. That's a positive statement. Or a negative one. We tried that and it didn't work. I'm sure you've heard that. What, what's a positive piece of that one? Well, well, that was then and this is now. That, that's a statement you can make to bring people back around to looking at change. And one of my favorites is, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. The positive opposite to that one is, well, every method can be improved. So the force field analysis helps address negativity and helps bring people around to change. Now, sometimes a change, a small change in your approach can actually make a big difference. There's a good phrase to change people's worldview to better reflect what reality is doing. The phrase that I think of it is, I think I know, but I could be wrong. Just try using that in your head or using that with other people and see if that helps them understand because not everybody knows all aspects of something. Finally, stories. Listening and telling stories. Our brains are built to hear stories. It is how children and adults learn best. Technology can get in the way of this learning or it can actually help us. Generations all go through phases in life, and when we're born affects the environment we grow up in. Every generation, though, needs to work with other generations to overcome their own weaknesses. So summarizing the older generations, you know, silent generation, the baby boomers, Generation X, what they need to do, and, and the best approach to working in today's world is to remain open-minded and to put value on new ideas. Don't just discard a new idea simply because it's new. It was then, this is now, right? Another point is sustainability. We all know that sustainability is good. We don't want things to fall apart, but sustainability in an organization really means recruiting and retaining younger associates. You have to see them as, as the assets of the future, as much as I hate to call a worker an asset. Um, perhaps the ideas they bring are the assets. And third, you want to be available to mentor people when it's time. Make time to talk to them and give them space to let them figure it out on their own. After all, that, that's what you were given. Uh, Zach can cover the younger generations. Okay, well, thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. Um, so looking at the younger generations, working with older generations, it's important for younger generations to recognize and respect the experience older generations bring to the table. It's often been found that older generations create the foundation for the society we're living in today, and it's important to recognize and respect that. And then Older generations tend to have decades of experience that they bring to the table, and younger generations can learn from them. They can learn about their institutional knowledge, or they could take it and combine it with some of their creativity to make new products or innovation. And for younger generations, it's also important to be willing to put in the work 
to learn new skills and abilities. The older generations did not get where they are just in one day or one week. It took them years of experience. They spent a lot of time learning to get certifications, sitting for the hours to apply for stuff, uh, advancing in their careers. And so younger generations have got to be able to put in that kind of work as well um, if they want to be successful today and in the future. And then invite collaboration. So look at working with older generations as an opportunity to merge their experience with new creative ideas. And really, I find that's a sweet spot for organizations and, and for younger generations having their technical skills, merging that with experience can create an endless amount of possibilities for everyone. And so to look at some future trends that will be affecting the workplace in the next five to 10 years, um, a lot of it's driven by technology. So uh, the emergence of automated and virtual, or sorry, augmented and virtual reality, uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain, looking at how organizations manage their data, so data governance and data quality, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So Doug had talked about this previously a few months ago, but this will be a massive trend. And if you look at some of the AI, like Amazon Alexa, in some ways we could laugh at it. We could say, oh, it, it might understand this or that, but in five to 10 years, it'll advance exponentially. And then voice technology, and just some questions to think about with generations at work, sort of as Doug was saying with, with younger generations, but also older generations, how do we recruit and retain our associates? And I think that's such an important question to think about today in the age of the great resignation, where we're seeing millions of people quit their jobs every month. Uh, what will the marketplace look like in five to 10 years? And just to throw some thoughts out there, um, looking at from a generational perspective, we'll see baby boomers and the silent generation generally leaving uh, the workforce or retiring. We'll see Generation X, uh, millennials, and then Generation Z take more leadership roles in organizations. And then we'll get a better sense of Generation Alpha's strengths and weaknesses. And so, over the next five to 10 years, it's really critical that baby boomers and the silent generation, they work with younger generations to help them learn their institutional knowledge so their organizations can continue to be successful. And then the last question to think about is, how are we serving a multi-generational customer base? So oftentimes we're serving more than just millennials or Gen Z, we're often serving several generations or maybe all of them. And so as we look at our products and services, we've got to be mindful of that. And here's some additional resources that Doug and I found that we thought might be helpful. Um, we have, there's several web articles here uh, referencing different generations. Um, Doug had mentioned Daniel Pink. Um, we had used that to talk about motivation. And then there's the quality toolbox, which is a, um, a book that has a lot of different quality tools in it that could be useful. And here's our contact information for Doug and I. Uh, feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn. Um, send us the email, we're more than happy to respond. And then we have our websites uh, listed there. And um, just wanted to see if any of you had any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, but just wanted to thank everyone for participating today. Um, as the chair of the Kansas City section, it was fun to do a joint meeting with QMD. I hope we could get this opportunity again. And um, for our Kansas City section, we do a lot of great events throughout the year, both virtual and in person. So if any of you want to come, you're more than welcome to. Feel free to reach out to me or some of the people on our team. Uh, we're more than happy to connect with you. And um, as Doug had mentioned at the beginning, we have the World Quality Conference coming up in a couple of weeks. And I'll be there. Um, I'll be giving a talk, so hopefully I'll, I'll see you in Anaheim. And um, feel free to come by the uh, Quality Management Division booth if you'd like to connect with Doug or I. Uh, we're more than happy to talk to you about this webinar or just questions in general that you have. And um, I'd like to thank Shoba and uh, Doug. Um, without them, this webinar wouldn't have been possible. And just for Doug, he's been a great mentor to me. Um, I think for a lot of you, he's been a, a mentor um, learning about leadership, cost of quality, 
uh, process management. So just want to thank him. And um, thank, thank you, know, you, Zach. Yeah. <laughs> we'll continue our conversation. So we have a link here or a QR code if you've got your uh, smartphone or tablet uh, on my SQ. Um, they'll be following this talk, and, and Doug and I will be monitoring this um, spot in my SQ. So you're welcome to post your thoughts in there, questions. And as we mentioned earlier, we're more than happy to connect with everyone. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. And we hope you enjoyed this event. And I believe we've got some time for questions. Yeah, thank you both, uh, Zach and Doug. That was a great presentation. So we are having some questions and comments come in, and I'll start bringing those up. So the first one we have is that the traits, which are the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities, are the same across global generations like Japanese, Europeans, Americans, et cetera? Hmm. Oh, that's that's an interesting one. Zach, want me to handle this? Sure, why don't you go first? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I think in the in the older generations, um, these these traits are gonna be different because the older generations grew up before a time when we truly had a global conversation going. And so it was difficult for uh, the, the boomers when they were young to know anybody in, I don't know, in Europe or in Japan. Now, the world has become flatter, as we've heard, and, and there's more conversations happening now across the globe. And of course, thanks to our friends over at Google, translation has become a thing that's relatively easy. So I think the younger generations may be becoming more similar across the world, but definitely the culture you grow up in will influence these traits. Zach, you got anything to add to that? Sure, I, I think you bring up some great points. Um, as we look at um, history, if we think about it, Generation X was the first group of adults that grew up with the internet and the three generations following them, Millennials, Gen Z, now Generation Alpha, um, they've spent pretty much their whole lives connected to the internet. And so um, that's created some real opportunities and challenges. I think in one way, it has flattened our world. It's made it where, uh, for instance, I could log into a video game um, online community and see people from everywhere. Um, so it's made connectivity a whole lot easier but then at the same time, it's brought challenges with it. Um, one of them, um, you know, that we started to see with millennials, but that's still prevalent with Gen Z and Generation Alpha is cyberbullying, um, where if, you know, bullying doesn't just happen in one place, it could, it could, you know, people could know about across the world. Um, and then knowing who, you know, your kids or, or young adults are engaging with because they might have friends online that they've never met in person. Um, but, but I think, it, as Doug was saying, to some extent, um, I think regardless of the country, there's a shared context that um, everyone grows up in. There's global economic, political, and social events that happen. But within each country, they still have their own unique culture, regardless of how advanced the Internet is or globalization. Um, so the generational cultures might be a little different country by country, but um, that global context still stays the same. And, and for our talk, we've mostly focused on the U.S., but um, I'm sure you'd see some shared traits across these generations uh, outside the U.S. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the uh, second question. In your opinion, what is the biggest challenge to create empathy among the silent X, Y, Z, baby boomers, and the alpha gens? Well, wow. uh, yeah, I, <laughs> so I, I said something earlier, okay? That statement, I think I know, but I could be wrong. That, that mental phrase tends to open a person's point of view up. Uh, and, and I think especially those of us who have lived a long time, seen a lot of stuff, and have built a, a, a very, a, a pretty accurate picture of the world in our head, 
sometimes we forget that it's not the real world, that what we think is going on could be wrong. We've come to trust our mental picture, but maybe we're making a mistake doing that. And I think that's the that's where it begins. That's where it begins to you, you begin to listen when you think that, well, I could be wrong here. Zach, what what do you think about that? Where does that go with, with the younger generation? Hmm. Well, it, it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I would say regardless of, of generation, I, I think it creates the opportunity um, to get out and, and really get to know people from different backgrounds. I, I think sometimes we get siloed within our own generations. Um, like some people only hang out with people closer to their age um, or people from their generation. And, uh, you know, myself, for instance, I, I grew up in um, uh, Boy Scouts, and so I interacted with adult leaders. I interacted a lot with Generation Z and Alpha, and I found it really enriching. And and so I think looking at it um, from kind of, a I guess, a work or volunteer standpoint, um, you know, get out there and have those conversations. Talk to your older workers. Talk to to younger workers. I think there's a lot of value from intergenerational communication. And I think as you get to know people from different generations and backgrounds, you start to realize that a lot of us are the same. And as I had talked about earlier, um, regardless of generation, their shared goals. All of us want to be successful to some extent. We want to have meaningful connections. We want to have fun. We want to do stuff we enjoy. Um, that transcends generations. And regardless of technology, the technology just gives us another way to experience that or, or communicate. But um, I, I think focusing on, on what brings the generations together, um, I think that's where you get that sense of empathy. And then we, all, we can all step back and realize we're all a lot similar than we are different. So next question we have on Gen Z, and we have two questions which are kind of similar, and I'm going to read those to you. So how do we help Generation Z with social skills without offense? And the related would be, uh, you mentioned that Gen Z sometimes tries to show that they are in charge. Tips on coaching that. Hmm. Well, um... I, I know there's a lot of stereotype out there that says, you know, these these younger generations are, are, I think the phrase the other boomers would use is, they are too thin-skinned. But part of the problem is that boomers have developed, and, and the science generation, we've developed a thick skin through living, just getting old, and we've forgotten. We've forgotten what it's like. To, uh, to to feel that offense from somebody who is is uh, saying something to us. I, I think active listening is one of the most undervalued tools in doing this. Uh, and and you know emotional intelligence, which half of it is, can you be aware of how others are receiving what you're saying? Are you looking at them? Are you understanding them? And, and if you have given offense, by all means, you need to apologize, honestly. And you need to say, I have, what did you hear that I told you? And, and build that back and forth communication link. Zach, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's, it's two really interesting questions. I think to try to look at the first one regarding social skills, for Generation Z um, and, and potentially Generation Alpha, uh, we have to remember that the context they've grown up in is they've always been connected. They've always had access to the internet. They've spent almost all their lives on social media, um, seeing themselves be compared to people from across the world. Um, they've never really known a time without a smartphone or without devices, and so, um, that, that limits their social skill development um, because staring at a screen um, or interacting with people in a, in a video game only gets you so far. 
um, like right now we're talking, um, so we could learn, um, you know, good verbal skills. But if you look at communication, more than half of it is nonverbal um, interactions. And so I think for Gen Z, it's recognizing the limits of technology with communication um, and trying to find some time to disconnect from it. But then also finding um, groups that have shared interests with them. So, um, you know, looking at hobbies as a way to connect with people. So, like esports is a big um, kind of emerging area for for Gen Z and Alpha. Um, you know, spending time in the outdoors, um, pursuing other other hobbies. For older people in Generation Z, getting out and going to networking events. Um, and then joining organizations like my ASQ, I, I think to be frank, um, I think ASQ is is a um, you know it's a it's a valuable gem I think for uh, younger generations, for millennials, Gen Z, Alpha, and you know future generations because my experience is that it's, it's been a great group of people that generally want to help each other. Um, you can get certified and grow, and so I I think professional organizations like ASQ are in a great position to connect with these generations, um, especially Gen Z. And then I think to the um, the second question about uh, the work ethic, um, I think part of that is just coming down to being really specific with um, what you want Gen Z to accomplish and then mentoring and building them up uh, to give them the tools to do it. Thank you, Zach. Um, I think that also addresses somewhat, there was another question that how do you recommend giving effective feedback to Gen Z? And um, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to take one more question for our next minute or so, and then we'll wrap up the webinar. So there's another one which says the relationship among these generations is crucial to have successful organization, and that's a question. There's no doubt. I, I'm, I'm in violent agreement with that. <laughs> I mean, no, these groups are not, they're not separate groups either. Understand that there are people who might be in between, right? Uh, their birth date might have been in between. They might have seen some of these things and not others. Um, or they might, they might identify with people that are in a different generation than the one they were born in. That happens too. So there, there's a bit of a spectrum here. And so you got to kind of realize that too. People who are between these generations can sometimes act as translators. Zach, what do you think? Wow. Well, I, I definitely agree with the statement. Um, just to give some thoughts on it, I, I think, one, we have to step back and realize that we're all more similar than we are different. If, if you talk about human beings from a biological standpoint, uh, we're 99.9% .9 the same. It's it's that 0.1% um, of our genetic makeup that accounts for um, our personality, um, our appearance, all those differences that make each of us unique. And so, um, I think just recognizing that oftentimes we're a lot more similar than we are different, uh, but then also respecting differences, um, be, being inclusive of different, you know, diversity of thought, of generational backgrounds. Um, I think this is where the intergenerational communication can come in. So getting out of the office, if you're at the house, um, doing calls on WebEx or Zoom, to get to know people better uh, between generations. Um, but then I think also, in a way, we have to kind of remove ourselves from where we are. Um, so like Doug and I, we're, we're each from different generations, but uh, with this webinar, we were able to step back and say, okay, well, how would this generation think about or, or how would that one? Um, so I think getting out of kind of our comfort zone and really just getting to know people and what motivates them I think that's what will help organizations be successful. And I think a lot of what we see in, in the Great Resignation today is kind of a disconnect with that, that there's an assumption, the old way that people were motivated and engaged at work um, could still apply today. And, and I think in reality, we've seen a lot of that upended or altered 
um, because the world we live in is not what it was three years ago. And um, I think as each generation comes along, organizations have to adapt to it. And if they're not able to, then it, it creates challenges and makes it difficult for them to have a good future. Thank you so much, um, Zach and Doug. I'm going to now uh, move on to the, the ending of the slides and stop recording now.